Hi, Assalamualaikum. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, I hope you're doing well, uh, keeping safe and uh, keeping the motivation up for learning online. Uh, today, I'm going to continue my lecture on uh, the, the course of CHM676, which is organometallic compound. This is uh, my fourth recorded lecture, uh, continuing from the uh, calculation of 18 electrons and how the metal-to-metal -metal bond bonds are formed uh, to make the 18 electrons and how you can use make use of this table one, which is in your notes, uh, to determine the charges of the ligands, for example, the charge of hydrido, fluoro, chloro, bromo, iodo, cyano, thiocyano, ah, uh, the charges are minus one. They're giving uh, two electrons, they are two electron donor, but there are some neutral uncharged uh, ligands, for example, carbonyl, um, uh, CNR, nitrosyl, phosphine, phosphide, and so on. Those are without any charges, uh, so the charge is zero, which is very important for you to know what charges are when you are counting electrons to determine the uh, to determine the oxidation state of your metal, and so on and so forth. And remember when in the in a few lectures ahead, you're going to be meeting uh, methyl, ethyl, and things and species like that. Your organic organic um, ligands, those are negatively charged with two electrons. So this is where you refer to to find out the charges and the number of electrons donated by each ligand. So I would like to... Um, continue today on substituted carbonyls, other pi acid complexes. Now, so far we have only met um, metal bonded with carbon monoxide and we call them metal carbonyls. Those are the simplest organometallic compounds around. They are really, really quite easy to deal with and it's easy for you to digest as someone who has just learned organometallic compounds. Now you have understood carbonyls. We are uh, making progress into meeting other ligands. Um, um, in organometallic chemistry, for substituted carbonyls and the term pi acid. Pi acid means any molecules or ions that can accept pi electrons onto themselves. Acid in the Lewis acid uh, definition, are uh, acids are electron acceptors, whereas bases are electron donors. So we know that ligands are electron donors. We have them donating ele electrons to the metal center, so they are actually Lewis bases. However, when um, they are able to accept electrons back onto themselves, then they're called, also called pi acid ligands. So one of the examples, uh, well, carbon monoxide is also a pi acid ligand because it is able to accept electrons from metal in the pi back bonding mechanism. If you can still recall, in the pi back bonding mechanism, metal is returning electrons back into carbon monoxide. So that makes carbon monoxide a pi acid, a pi acceptor or pi electron acceptor. Okay, I'm going to go into substituted carbonyl and uh, we're going to deal with the first one, which is a uh, phosphine. Phosphine is a ligand, a neutral ligand with two electron donor um, uh, behavior as well. So when neutral uh, Lewis bases such as phosphine and phosphates, these are phosphates, POR3, 
they can be used to replace carbon monoxide in organometallic compounds. This replacement is possible because just like carbon monoxide, the P3 ligands have a lone pair of electrons, a lone pair of electrons on P for the sigma donation from the homo, um, homo molecular orbital. And then it also has, the phosphines also have empty orbitals of the pi symmetry, which could be the D orbitals on P or the antibonding PC or PO molecular orbitals, which is the LUMO. And then they also have filled pi orbitals. So depending on the identity of R, how much those pi orbitals are filled depends on what is the identity of R. Now, the donor and acceptor ability of these ligands is influenced by the identity of R. The pi acidity uh, or the bonding ability, the more acid, the more acidic, the more pi acid the ligand is, the better it bonds with metals. Yeah, because it will be able to accept pi back bonding from metal very, very easily. So that will facilitate stronger bonding. Uh, the pi acidity, hence the bonding ability, is enhanced by electron withdrawing groups such as fluorine, chlorine, and phosphate. This electron withdrawing species will, with, will reduce electron density on the LUMO, on the lowest on unoccupied molecular orbital, making the ligand more receptive toward electrons being pushed from the metal towards it. So if your LUMO is very empty, it is very easy for, for that particular ligand to accept electrons in the pi back bonding, making it a very, very pi acid ligand and making it having very good bonding ability with the metal. Um, based on the infrared and NMR studies, the general accepted order of pi acidity of the ligands containing P3 is in this way. So you have PF3, PCL3. PF3 is more pi acidic than PCL3. PCL3 is more pi acidic, meaning more ready to accept electrons in this order. So PF3 is very, very easy for it to accept electrons, whereas P R3 or methyl or ethyl or any alkyl in that matter will be the least acidic or the least easiest, the, the most difficult to accept electrons, but they can still accept electrons. So the order of pi acidity in, is in this way and the bonding ability is highest for PF3 compared to PR3 and anything in the middle. Yep. So how is that explained? That will be explained in a while. I'm going to make a, a, a little drawing here to show you how that is achieved. Um, PF3 is uh, more pi acidic than PCL3. PCL3 is more acidic than PO with aromatic ring, more acidic than PO with uh, alkyl, aromatic, and PR3. This trend can be explained in two ways. The first way, we can explain it through the electronic factor, which I'm going to do in a while. And the second way to explain it is through the steric factor or through the space factor. So how do you explain this, train, this trend using the electronic factor? Now look at this draw, uh, drawing. This is a molybdenum with four carbon monoxide attached to it. And on the fifth and sixth position, you have PF3. And then in the other molecule, you have PME3 one with fluorine substituent attached to the phosphorus and another with the methyl substituent attached to the phosphorus. Now, um, 
Let's go through the differences between the two substituents. The electron withdrawing or electron donating property of the substituent, fluorine is electron withdrawing species, whereas methyl is electron donating species. Now it can be seen in this uh, um, um, second. Format, shape, outline, let's do, do blue. It can be seen using this uh, arrow. The arrow in the first uh, compound means that the electrons are moving away. Yeah, The fluorine is pulling electrons away from the phosphorus, this one, whereas methyl, is um, <laughs> this is bad? Yep, undo. Let me undo that. Whereas methyl, on the other hand, is enriching the phosphorus with electrons. This is making phosphorus poorer in electron, whereas in the other one, methyl is making the phosphorus richer in electron. The same as the what's going on at the bottom. The ability to accept electrons of this species, either PF3 or PME3, PF3 has a higher ability to accept electron, whereas PME3 has a lower ability to accept electron. Now, if you look at the paragraph above, it says, by acidity, hence bonding ability. Now, accepting electrons mean... Um, Accepting electrons mean uh, acidity. Yeah, let me do this. Acidity. Higher high uh, acidity of PF3 compared to PME3. And bonding ability of PF3 is higher than the bonding ability of PME3. Yep. So you can uh, tell that this is a more pi acid ligand than that one over there. Now, what is the effect of the difference in the pi acidity of these two ligands, the effect on the carbon monoxide um, uh, ligand here? Now, if we look at the flow of electrons, I'm just going to show you half of half of the molecule because it's going to uh, the same thing happening at the top. The flow of electrons is away from the metal. If you look at the flow of this electron, it is away from the metal center, whereas in here, the flow is towards the metal center, making this metal center, the electron density on the metal center, it becomes lower for this species and higher for that species. So let me just call this species A. So this, yep, this is there. So this is species A. Whereas the other one is species B. Easier to say in that way. This species and that species. Yep. Where is B? That is species. This is species B. Yeah. So in species A, where the substituted ligand is PF3, the flow of electron is away from the metal, the electron density on this metal molybdenum is lower, uh, the opposite is happening to species B, the electron density on the LUMO of CO, remember, when you are pulling electrons away um, uh, from electrons, uh, from the metal, 
Okay, we go into pi back bonding. Now, with the lower electron density on the metal, it is going to be less able, this one here, going to be less able to do pi back bonding to the carbon monoxide. Now, we are the effect of the thing that's happening here is on that metal to carbon bond. You have less pi back bonding happening from this molybdenum to that carbon monoxide because this particular molybdenum has lower electron density. Comparing with the species B, where methyl is making molybdenum richer with electrons, there is the, this particular molybdenum in B is more able to do pi back donation from the molybdenum to carbon. Yeah? So the pi back bonding from metal to carbon monoxide in the case of A is lower, whereas in the case of B is higher. I hope you understand that. That means when you do pi back bonding, where do the electrons go? The electrons would go to homo or lumo. Pi back bonding will put electrons in the lumo. If you can recall our lecture about two lectures ago, the electron density on the lumo of CO is lower in A than it is in B because in B it has more pi back bonding happening, right? So what is the relationship between the density of electrons in lumo of carbon monoxide with bond order? Do you know, do you recall what is bond order? Bond order is, I hope you can remember, let me put it here just as a note. Bond order is equal to is equal to half of uh, half of sum of bonding electrons minus minus sum of empty bonding electrons. I hope that's Yeah. Okay. Bond order is when you have all the bonding electrons minus all the antibonding electrons, divide that by two. So if you have more antibonding electrons, bond order will become less. Betul? If you have less of antibonding electron, bond order will become more. So with less uh, electrons in the LUMO, and if you recall, let me go back, scroll back to the Top, almost the top of these notes. Um, I don't know whether it's in the lecture. Okay, almost the top of these notes. Where are they? Yep. Aha. Uh -huh. In here. Sorry. Um, your LUMO, remember, your LUMO is antibonding in nature. So when you are doing pi back bonding, you are populating this antibonding molecular orbital. So making this antibonding molecular orbital richer with electrons will only increase bond order. Yeah, you're making this antibonding lumo. Why do you know antibonding? Because it is there. It is antibonding asterisk. Yeah. When you're making this richer with electrons, the LUMO is antibonding, then you are putting more electrons to be, to be uh, deducted from the bonding. 
so you have the bond order increasing. Let me go back to this notes. It's go back and forth, back and forth. This is not making it easy. Yep. Yeah. The bond order of A, the bond order of CO in A will be higher than it is in B. Bond strength, bond order if... Uh, if a single bond, bond order is 1. If double bond, bond order is 2. If triple bond, then bond order is 3. So, with you with a higher bond order, that means the CO will have a higher strength. With a higher strength, now remember Planck's equation. There's another note here that you have to recall. Planck's equation is... Planck's equation is H equals equals energy, sorry. Energy is equal H C H hmm, this is not doing well. H C over lambda. Uh, which is equal to H nu. Yep. So energy, yeah, the bond strength is higher. So your H nu will also be higher. So if you run this uh, compound in an infrared spectra, uh, in the infrared machine, what you will see is the frequency of, uh, the stretching frequency of CO of A will be higher than the stretching frequency of CO of B. So that is the effect of changing the substituent on your um, phosphine in this case. So let's go through that again. I know this is a concept that is not too familiar with you, uh, to you yet. Okay, comparing, a question may be asking like this, what is the effect on the uh, CO bond strength when you replace PF3 with PME3 or something like that. A question we would be asking like that. Explain your answer. So it is like this. You will answer that when you replace PF3 with PME3, the CO will become weaker and it will have lower frequencies, lower stretching, infrared st stretching frequency. The explanation is like this, because in when F is there, it will pull away electrons from molybdenum. Molybdenum will become uh, poor with electron. It's not going to be able to do pi back bonding to carbon monoxide much. It is going to be to do a little. And the carbon monoxide receiving little pi back bonding from molybdenum will have less electron density on the LUMO. And with LUMO uh, less populated, the bond order will become higher because you are subtracting a smaller number here. Subtracting a smaller number there. So... The bond order will become higher of CO. The CO will become stronger bond. And then the stronger bond is reflected in the higher frequency of uh, new CO. Whereas in the PME3, methyl is an electron donating group making molybdenum richer with electrons. And molybdenum in B is more able to do pi back donation to carbon monoxide. And the LUMO in carbon monoxide will become more densely populated, making this number very big. 
And making that number big means your bond order will become smaller. The CO bond order will become smaller. When the CO bond order is smaller, the CO bond strength will reduce, will become lower, and the stretching frequency of CO will also become lower. So that is um, the effect of changing this. So what we are saying here is having a, a high acidity substituted ligand will will give rise to all these things happening yeah and the pi acidity of pf3 is higher than the pi acidity of pme3 due to the fact that it is more able the pf3 is more able to accept electrons than pme3 now looking at that when we say that the bonding ability of pf3 is higher then the bonding ability of PME3, we are saying that this bond molybdenum to phosphorus is stronger than this bond molybdenum to phosphorus. Stronger in A than it is in B, the molybdenum to phosphorus. And how that can be explained using the steric factor. Now, another factor affecting the bonding ability is steric factor, which is measured by the Tolman cone angle as shown below. Tolman is the name of a scientist. Now, if you have a metal here and there is a phosphorus here, putting F in three directions like that, you can imagine that this theta will become a lot small. Uh, will, it's going to be quite small because fluorine is small. So this angle cannot be too big. But when you replace fluorine with methyl, methyl is a lot bigger than fluorine. Isn't it right? Because methyl is CH3. Now imagine you have CH3 here. This is going to be more um, open, more open. And this theta is going to become bigger. If you look at this drawing, I'm try I, I, I draw it like this. PF3 is more kunchop, more um, uh, sm um, small compared to PME3, which is more expanded. Yeah, more expanded. And uh, now, in terms of space, when you have a small car compared to a big car, which one is easier to park? Of course, you're going to park the smaller car much more comfortable than the bigger car. So in terms of space, it is much easier also for PF3 to bond with molybdenum compared to PME3 bonding with molybdenum. So this big ligand will bond less with molybdenum. It's going, it's going to be able to approach quite far from the molybdenum compared to this one. This one small, it can approach uh, closer to the molybdenum, making it bond stronger with the molybdenum in the case of A. So smaller Tolman cone angle should lead to better bonding by permitting closer ligand approach to the metal center. However, only cone angles between 140 to 160 are uh, required for significant steric effects. So if you look at this table, look at this table here. Here is a very, very big ligand. Imagine, uh, let's take this. This is a very, very big ligand, PPH3, phenyl. You have this phosphorus attached to three benzene ring. Can you imagine how big that is? The Tolman cone angle, this one is big, 145. It's almost 180, almost a big opening. Yeah. When this is big, comparing it to, for example, PME3, the smaller, this is methyl. Methyl is a lot smaller than your benzene ring which is only 118, you will immediately see comparison between this and that. You will immediately see that 
PPH3 is going to be less able to bond properly with metal compared to PME3 due to the size. So that effect is called the Tolman cone angle effect. Yeah? Tolman cone angle effect shown by the theta, the, the value of uh, angle theta here. Therefore, it can be concluded that ligands need to be fairly big group attached to P in order for it to show static effect due to the Tolman cone angle effect. Okay, so the conclusion of this lecture is if you have a substituted ligand uh, replacing carbon monoxide in one uh, organometallic compound, this situation may occur. One substituted ligand will be will be more able to bond with the metal compared to another in this series. And the explanation as I have gone through with you in this lecture. Um, now, this is uh, an addition that I have just added. You don't have it in your notes. So I hope you can um, uh, write this down yourself, put this in your own notes so you can understand what I'm talking about. So that's it for now, this lecture. I'm going to conclude the lecture by, um, uh, by showing you this Tolman cone angle. So you can understand this properly i will i will give you more ex more uh, practice exercises in the group chat so you can understand the topic better there are many many past papers that have questions regarding this uh, topic so that's it thank you for now um, uh, please uh, ask me any question if you don't have a, if you don't understand anything i hope it's clear though so that's it Thank you. Take care. Keep safe, everybody. And uh, see you next week. I'm going to schedule the viewing in your future. Bye-bye. Assalamu alaikum.